Hey everybody, welcome back to Therapist Unmasked. I'm Ashley. And I'm Sam. And please join us as we enter the world of EMDR therapy with our therapist friend, Christina. We hope you enjoy the episode and let's roll the intro. Hi, beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on to our podcast. We're super excited to have you on. So please introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from, what you do for work, and what your views are on mental health. Yeah. So yay. I'm so happy to be here. I love the podcast. I love sort of the just nature of unmasking a therapist and humanizing them. It's wonderful. Um, so my name is Christina Spurlock. Um, so I am based out of Seattle, Washington. And uh, what I do for work is right now, I currently uh, have my own private practice. So I do that full time. Um, that's new for me. I started that about five months ago. And before then, I was um, working full time at a hospital, um, at a crisis intervention center, working with survivors of sexual assault. Um, and so this has been a really interesting experience to branch out on my own and do private practice and manage absolutely everything. It's been very different, um, but really rewarding. I love that. Um, And then my views on mental health. I mean, I think mental health is physical health. They're just as, it's just as important. It's because it's the exact same thing. Um, I think a lot of people like to separate those things. So physical health, you break an arm, you go to the hospital, you get treatment, everybody can physically see what's happening. Mental health is you're depressed, you're anxious, but nobody can see what's happening. Therefore, it's not as real. And I think that part of my work is spreading this awareness of it's, it's just as real. Like you would call out if you physically couldn't make it to work, you can call out if you emotionally can't make it to work. Um, And so that's kind of my view on my mental health and sort of breaking down that stigma of, yes, if you had something wrong with you physically, you would go and get help. Why not do that for your mental health as well? How long have you been practicing for and what piqued your interest to focus on trauma? Yeah. So I uh, first did my master's program, started in 2015, graduated 2017, um, and did my internship at that same hospital um, in 2016. And so um, I had started working there. And I, I before then, I had worked at um, a uh, rape and domestic violence advocacy center in uh, Oregon, where I went to school. And I just really liked working with survivors. I felt that being there, sharing safe space for their story, like that was really not only obviously empowering to me, but empowering to them to have finally a safe space where they can just unload. Um, And so I really enjoyed working with survivors. And so I took that into my internship as well and started doing that. And um, I did my internship for about a year, but then I did other things. I did community mental health, group practices, work with teens, things like that. But then came back to that hospital um, like three years ago because I was like, well, I loved this work. I loved the people I worked with and I wanted to come back and do that again. Wow. That sounds really interesting. Um, It was fantastic. So what made you go into the specific field? Because I'm also in trauma, but I was never one to say, I'm going to go into trauma. This is what I'm going to do. My whole spectrum was children and family for almost three years. So what is your background with trauma and how did you get into it? Yeah. So I really enjoyed the women's, women's violence, women's studies classes at my university. I thought that it was really interesting that like I myself have been part of a domestic violence relationship, but I hadn't really been able to name what was happening. Um, I kind of was, you know, gaslit, called crazy, all those fun things. And so I was like, oh, I'm the problem. It's me, right? I'm the issue. And then I took classes like that and I was like, oh, interesting. I'm not the problem. That is so interesting. Fantastic. And so I took that information to then start working. That's kind of what motivated me to then start working with domestic violence victims to kind of see, not necessarily heal my own things through them, but to like help understand not only what was happening for them, but also for me Um, to to be there primarily for them. And then also I'm like, if I learned something about my situation as well, or if I learned some resources and tools, like fantastic and wonderful. And it just kind of evolved where When then I took on my internship in 2016, I started noticing that not only were people coming in for sexual assault issues, but also like the trauma that they had experienced leading up to those issues. And I say this with delicacy because not everybody who's experienced, you know, trauma before the sexual assault experiences sexual assault and not everybody who's experienced sexual assault has like a traumatic background. Right. So like, I don't know if those things are connected, but I noticed that 
it wasn't, we weren't just working on processing the sexual assault. We were working on processing negative cognitions from past traumas. And so that kind of got me really interested in just kind of learning, okay, so maybe there is some correlation between like, you know, the way that we're raised or the way that we think about ourselves or the traumas that we have. And then also maybe increasing our chances of ending up in a relationship that isn't safe. Um, and then I, you know, I, I think as all therapists, like we all have our own sort of maybe traumatic quote unquote background, right? That varies to some degree, but I think, you know, we also experience our own traumas. And so um, learning, have our lived experiences processing and learning through that and then seeing those same patterns in other people. I think that you just kind of develop this, I don't know, for me, at least you develop sort of this want to learn more about those things. Again, not for you to heal, but just to learn those things like, oh, oh, that pattern makes a lot of sense. Like I was, you know, I don't know, ridiculed as a child or bullied as a child. And now I have no self-esteem growing up. Like, interesting how that works. It all connects. So mm -hmm. I think, yeah, just kind of seeing how often trauma was coming up for people and how similar it was, but the experiences that resulted were completely different. When we have our meetings of trauma, of the trauma department, um, and mm -hmm. we start to talk about a yarn, it's like a yarn, yarn ball unraveling. And when you start to unravel it, sometimes it can come like the unraveling process can be just straight and it'll be perfect. It'll be fine. And then sometimes there's going to be knots and you have to take time with those knots to undo them, to make sure that the rest of the yarn is going to come out properly. And it's a tricky I process. Analogy. I love it. Yeah. It's a tricky process. But at the end of the day, once you get to the end of the yarn, you know that it's going to be a clear, clean cut and it's going to be done but you're still obviously going to have that long path that you're going to remember of, but it's going to be a healed path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. You can more quickly connect those pieces together, you know, and again, for, for future reference, you can reference the past, right? So, oh, that's right. My therapist and I worked on, yeah, processing this, this plus this equals this. This is typically what triggers me. I'm going to take that information into the future and then, you know, either limit my triggers or know what my triggers are so that that way, if they happen, I can then follow the path back to what has helped me, you know, process these triggers in the past or cope with them or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that analogy. That's fantastic. It's so interesting that like I'm I'm starting to branch out because I'm in private practice and now I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't have any coworkers to talk to. I'm like trying really hard to like use Instagram or use social media mm -hmm. as a way to maybe branch out and like, you know, talk with other therapists and meet people and go on podcasts and, you know, things like that. And so um, I'm noticing that I thought, I thought that all therapists had trauma cases. And now mm -hmm. I'm recognizing that like, that's not the case. Like, I'm like, I'm sitting here and I'm like, no, every single one of my clients comes to me with extremely heavy trauma because that's what I specialize in. And I was talking to somebody the other day and they're like, oh my God, every single one of your clients has like intense trauma. I don't know how I would handle that. And I'm like, I didn't know there was another option. Um, I work currently in, a, in an outpatient clinic. And so I'm, it's, it's not like we have like a different, we're, I'm in a different department, but it's not like there's a wall between us mm -hmm. yeah. so all of our offices are on the same wing and we get to all talk to each other and I came to the realization that everybody has different specialties in this one building and everyone just like me had to learn how to handle their caseloads because they also may have started in a completely different department and got this job where they were like oh my goodness I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to handle this. Yeah. And as therapists, they see us as people that we know exactly what to do, when to do it. And We're professionals. Like, yeah. No, <laughs> we have to learn on the job. And especially when it comes to suicide, that's also a very scary topic. And for a very long time, it was actually a very taboo topic. Not mm -hmm. everybody talked about it. There wasn't much awareness out in the world. So when I first started my current job and I got a client who was had suicidal ideation, I remember I was in my room and I was like, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. Yeah, All that training seven. just out the window. Yep. <laughs> I don't know what to do. So um, at that point, I called my supervisor and I was like, what do I do? Like, I'm freaking out a little bit right now, even though like I stayed calm in front of her. I 
I'm nervous. I don't know what to do. And she was like, it's okay. It's okay. Call her mom. She knows that you have to call her mom because she's a minor um, and talk to her and say how you need to take her to the hospital and And just go as the process flows. I'm like, okay, okay. Now I know exactly what to do, but as a beginner, it's like very anxious. You're like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. We've run over this case, (laughs) you know, with this vignette 400 times in graduate school, but yet, you know, when you're confronted with it in real life, it's like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. And I mean, that is amazing that you in that moment in your panic were like, I need to reach out to my supervisor because they're going to know what to do. Like, I honestly have experienced, not personally or professionally, but I've experienced working with other people who they're like, oh, I didn't know what to do. So I just, I just pushed through it or like something totally unethical, totally weird. And it's like, okay, no, no. While you are learning, like you are learning and people know that you're learning. And so you need to go to rely on the people who know what they're doing because you're learning, you know, like Mm -hmm. you can't expect to know everything as it comes up. You cannot be expected to be proficient or efficient in everything that you're doing. Like you just can't when you're first starting out or even like three years in, you still are learning new things, you know? So I think that's amazing. Like, again, a lot of people are like, oh no, yeah, no, I'll figure it out. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not your time to figure something out. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You need to go to people who've already figured it out and get the information and apply it. (laughs) Exactly. So with you, in a private practice and no supervisor, how do you deal with um, counter transference if it happens or even just issues that can cause anxiety? So I I definitely still have a supervisor. Um, I'm also a clinical supervisor, but I'm not currently seeing any clients right now because I want to focus on building my own private practice. Um, But in terms of like EMDR, so I'm a EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapist. And so I'm always uh, looking for supervisors who, you know, are proficient in EMDR. And so I currently have a supervisor that I see every month just to run over cases with and you know, she's a genius. So I'm like, teach me your ways. Like, I'd love to learn more from you. Um, I'll pay, here's all of my money. Like, let's do this. And so, um, that's kind of how I still process things. And I also do, even though I'm not in supervision, you know, every week, um, like I used to be, you know, when I was first starting out and even, you know, up until a couple years ago, um, I feel like, there are still consultation groups that I try really hard to to be a part of. So like my old supervisor, who was my colleague at um, the hospital, I still meet with her every so often and we go over cases and we talk and stuff. And then, you know, like I said, I'm trying really hard to like reach out and make therapist friends. So I still, you know, have coffee with people and have coffee with people I used to work with. Um, And while that's very informal and not like running through cases at Starbucks, (laughs) it's, um, it's still really nice to just have that support and just bounce ideas off of people. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, so to your question about like the counter-transference and like getting anxiety and feeling panic and be like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. Um, I think if that came up for me, and it, I mean, it has certainly, but I think right now, if it was to come up for me, I think I would probably reach out to the people that I talk to most frequently. So like my old supervisor, um, my past colleagues, like um, my friends who are therapists, I probably would reach out to them and just be like, hey, can I talk to you on the phone for a second? I would just want to run something real quick by you. Just make sure I'm not crazy. Pick your brain, things like that. And th- we're, we're usually pretty receptive to that. Okay, that's cool. Um, yeah. As you said you were an EMDR therapist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what interventions do you use? Yeah. So, I mean, with EMDR, like it's – it the whole thing is kind of an intervention, but there's specific things within that. So, like there's a lot of um, somatic sensory stuff that we use. So always checking in with your body, always using grounding, always uh, making sure that, you know, if any dissociation comes up during processing that we're like, you know, taking care of that right away. Um using a lot of, I mean, not necessarily cognitive behavioral therapy techniques, but we're certainly focusing on cognitive stuff like negative cognitions. How are you feeling about yourself? How does, when you think about this trauma, what comes up for you? Um, And so, yeah, there's a lot of things, but EMDR in and of itself is a pretty strict modality, meaning that it has like a phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, all the way to phase eight. And it's, you know, it's, it's a protocol that you're supposed to follow pretty close to the letter. But I think once you kind of really have memorized the protocol, know what you're doing, then you can kind of add a little bit of flair to it. So you don't have to follow it to the T, but you, you use it as like a loose structure, basically. Uh, so I literally know nothing about EMDR. So I think it's really interesting to to hear it from you. And I was really 
excited to meet you just to learn more about it because I was like, I literally know nothing about it. And honestly, um, actually, so a client that I came across was like, I need somebody that specializes in EMDR. And I don't, I know nothing about it again, right? So yeah. I, in the clinic that I work at, they were like, well, we don't really have an EMDR specialist here because it is not like an evidence-based practice or something mm. like that. There's people who say that. And I didn't know that, honestly. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering like what you would say to those people who are just like, this is not an evidence-based practice. It's not scientifically proven because I'm only just learning this recently. So yeah. I'm wondering like where your head has, where your head is with that. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely scientifically based. It's absolutely evidence-based. Um, I think the biggest thing that I equate EMDR to, I mean, so when we talk about eye movements and reprocessing, that's the same mechanism you use when you're in REM sleep. So REM mm -hmm. sleep, right? Your rapid eye movement has been proven. The reason why your brain does that is because it is physically using your eyes as a manual manipulation tool to communicate your right to your left hemisphere. So while your eyes are moving, it's literally passing information between both hemispheres. And so that we're taking that mechanism, that REM sleep mechanism, and just integrating it into a therapy modality where you can then access things that wouldn't be easy to access with talk therapy. You're able to manually access those things and manually process those things. And so we're finding too that not only, and especially with COVID, when that happened and we weren't able to do in-person sessions, we also found there was tons of research that showed that just bilateral stimulation, meaning stimulate your right and your left side alternating, um, even just doing tapping or like, um, so tapping like, you know, on your shoulders or your hands, or even just snapping into your ears, if you have some sort of like auditory bilateral stimulation, that works just as well as eye movements. And so like, I don't know if you've ever experienced when you're out for like a leisurely walk or a stroll or you're on the elliptical or something. And let's say you're not listening to music. Let's say you're just zoning out. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden at the end of your walk, you've kind of realized, oh, I've kind of zoned out a little bit, but but I feel better. Like I feel mentally maybe more clear or, oh, oh, an idea came up to me that I wasn't even thinking about, but I was on this walk and this came to me. Like that's also bilateral stimulation is walking as well because you're alternating your right and your left sides of your body. And so like it's it's definitely evidence-based. I have like tons of like research, like, I don't know, websites and articles and things that I send to people who are like, oh, it's not evidence-based. And it's like, actually EMDR is evidence-based. Hypnotherapy is not evidence-based. And so mm -hmm. sometimes people get it confused because there's eye movements involved. People think that hypnotherapy and EMDR are very similar and they are completely opposite. The only thing they have in common is eye movements. Um, hypnotherapy, therapy is one, and again, I'm not a licensed hypnotherapist, so I might be butchering on this, but mm -hmm. hypnotherapy, from my understanding, is it's the therapist who's kind of implanting an idea into the client, whereas EMDR is we as the therapist are literally only facilitating either eye movements or like the interventions that I mentioned, so um, grounding, negative cognitions, things like that. We're pretty much just doing that while the client's brain is processing everything at its own speed. So that's why EMDR is so effective for literally anything going on. If we have a co-occurring disorder, if we have anxiety, if we have trauma, if we have depression, if we have OCD, EMDR can be used for any of that because it's not one modality that fits all. It's literally that person's brain processing it at a speed it needs to. So it's, I mean, it's one of the most amazing therapies ever. And I just recently got into like an online debate, an argument. So somebody online who was like, you can't say EMDR is magical. You can't say that it's, you know, the best therapy ever. You can't make these absolute statements. And I'm like, until I am proven wrong, I will make such statements. Thank you very much. <laughs> like, I will make those statements because there is not one client that I haven't worked with where I haven't seen real change happen right before my eyes in one session. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's an incredible therapy modality. I'm just wondering, like, how, what do sessions look like when, when it comes to just, like, starting the process? And, yeah. and tell me about it, because I don't know. I know nothing. Yeah, okay. So, basically, um, when it comes to, like, those eight phases, so the first phase is what's called history taking. So, I tell my clients, this looks a lot like normal therapy. So, what I'm doing as the EMDR therapist, while we are talking, while we're establishing rapport, while we're getting to know each other, what I'm doing... I'm locking in in my mind the things that I think would be helpful to process 
more in depth. So for example, you know, I go through like genograms, like we talk about family trees, we talk about family dynamics, we talk about, um, you know, just tell me, I don't say like, tell me your most traumatic memory, but basically like suss out what are the things that stand out most to you when you're, you know, dreaming at night, like what are your dreams about, you know? So it's not necessarily just these random questions. The questions have a purpose and the purpose is what do I think is a theme that would be really helpful to process? So for example, some themes that I find are when clients are talking to me, sometimes they're saying like, you know, oh, I'm not good enough or, you know, I didn't do enough or I'll never be loved or things like that. I lock those things away or I write them down because my brain is mush. You know, I have a million tabs open as well. Like my, my brain's mush. So I write everything <laughs> down. Um, and so I write down these things of like, okay, I think this would be really beneficial. And then what I do is after history taking, that can take anywhere from three sessions to a year. Literally history taking is one of those things where people are like, I'm not doing EMDR. Let's do EMDR. And it's like, no, this is all part of EMDR. You just think EMDR is eye movements, but I promise this whole thing builds up to what the processing actually looks like. Because if you don't trust me, or if I don't trust you, or if I haven't assessed for dissociation, or if I haven't done my work, if we jump into processing right now and we're both not ready, like there's no point. In fact, there's a chance that I might make things worse. So I want to make sure that I'm on the same page and we're on the same wavelength and we have the same goals. And so history taking can, again, take from three sessions to however long, depending on where that person is at in their healing process. If this is their first time in therapy and they just want to, that's perfectly fine. It's just going to take a little bit longer to get on to phase two, <laughs> just a little longer. Um, phase two means that we are now assessing what coping skills the client has um, to kind of work through the stuff. So I want to know when things come up for you or if, you know, we encounter a memory that's really hard for us to process together. What are some coping skills that you're actually going to have in your back pocket that we can, you know, use either in session, outside of session, wherever. And so assessment means building up those coping skills. And so then we spent a good chunk talking about that. Um, this is also where I assess for dissociation. So I've kind of mentioned that a couple of times. So when someone is like disconnected from their body or disconnected from the room or, you know, whatever, feeling like their thoughts and their feelings are not on the same wavelength, we can't process anything. Processing cannot be done when dissociation happens, which is also why we kind of discourage any substance use as well, because substance use can cause um, a communication between our mind and our body. Um, and so if people, you know, take like sleep gummies, but have THC in them for bed, or, you know, they drink a glass of wine before bed and stuff like that. I, I discourage people from doing that the night before session, just because that stuff can still be in your system. And I just want to make sure that I have a raw understanding of what's happening. Um, this does not include anxiety medication. This does not include mood stabilizers, medications, things like that. It just includes like external extra substances. Um, and so, yeah, so we can spend a good time, a good chunk working on coping skills and assessing. Um, but then when we get into the actual processing, then that's phase three, which is called um, like evaluation or setting up the memory to be processed. Um, and so that is a really fun one because then I get to then take all the information that I learned during history taking and then get to say, okay, so this is what I learned about you. I am feeling like there is a huge like negative cognition around self-worth, self-love, things like that let's go back and tie that to a memory that we want to start on. And so typically we pick like the youngest memory, typically pick like what's called a touchstone memory, the first memory that's related to this. This is also when we use somatic intervention. So tell me what you're feeling in your body when you feel or when you think about that. Okay, have you felt this another time in your life? When's the time that you felt this the most? Things like that. Um, and then from phase three, we just jump right into um, what's called desensitization, which is where we use the eye movements or the bilateral stimulation to then sort of help them work through that. Um, and so, yeah, basically the super long answer to your question is um, an entire EMDR process can take anywhere from one session to 10 years. <laughs> So like there's no, there's no timeline and it's completely dependent on the person's brain, their body, the rapport, what, you know, what therapy they've had before, how much they trust therapists, things like that. So it's just, it's totally independent when people ask how, how long will it take me to process a memory? I'm like, I have no flipping idea. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> do you tell them what to do or like, mm -hmm. how, so like, how does that work? Yeah. So, um, for me, what I'm, so I prefer in-person sessions. I do, I do still offer online ones, but it's like one day a week and I'm like not here for it. I'm like, man, I don't like this. So <laughs> when I do in-person sessions, I have what are called tappers. So they're just these little like wireless vibrating buzzer things that I have my clients wear around their wrist. Um, and then from my phone, I can control the intensity. So how hard the buzzers are actually buzzing on them. And I can control the speed. So how fast the bilateral actually happens, um, which is 
really, really cool. And then from there, uh, how it used to go before COVID is we used to be really close to people, really, really close to people. And I would sit like this, my head kind of out of the way. I would sit with my two fingers up and I would just move them side to side. I cannot even tell you how tired my arms would get after like <laughs> three sessions in a row. Like, holy crap. Um, <laughs> so the buzzers have been a godsend because I'm like, great, look at the look at the buzzers. Like, look at them as they go. Wonderful. My arms can just rest easy now. So basically, we kind of just talk about like, these are these are natural mechanisms that your body is used to doing anyway for processing. So people are like, oh my God, if I move my eyes, like, oh, what's going to happen? Oh my gosh. And it's like, you move your eyes every single night when you go to sleep. Like this is not a new mechanism for you and your body is going to know what to do. It's just going to feel weird doing it awake, basically. Um, And we kind of describe the feeling of EMDR as if you've ever been sitting on a, a train and you're kind of looking out the window and you're kind of, kind of zoning out, but you're not really, you're kind of just like seeing things pass by you and you're like, oh, I can recognize what that is. Oh, I can recognize what that is. Like as it passes by, but it doesn't stay. That's kind of what EMDR is like. So you're able to recognize I'm sitting on the train or I'm sitting in my therapist's you know, room, but I'm noticing that things are just kind of going by me and they're not going by super fast. Like I can recognize what they are, but they're not staying. So they're not, you know, I'm not just sitting in whatever's coming up for me. So it's a really, it's just a really interesting process. And again, it's different for everybody. So that's kind of the general explanation that I give, but it could be different. People could either see everything all at one time, or they could see nothing. They just feel things in their body. It's very interesting. That is interesting. And sounds like you have done, put in so much work into learning this, this whole intervention. It's really, it sounds I I want to do more research on it now, um, but you have done yeah. so much research. Have you ever worked on a paper or ever done a class or anything based on this intervention? I haven't. I'm so currently uh, in the process of getting my what's called a consult in training or being a consultant when it comes to EMDR. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm trained through the uh, EMDR International Association, which was founded by Francine Shapiro, who is like the creator of EMDR. Um, And do you guys want to hear the story of how Francine like found out about EMDR? It's really yes. easy because I literally know nothing. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> so Francine, she's just this like, you know, psychologist walking in the wilderness one day. And all of a sudden she's noticing that she is like uh, remembering something. She's just walking through the woods, having a fun like time by herself. She's noticing that she's remembering something that makes her kind of upset. I can't remember exactly what the memory was. I think it was like um, she just remembered something just dist- like distressing about like a family member or something. So she started thinking about how upset that family member was that was making her upset. She just kind of was like, oh, God, oh, this, this feeling does not feel good. She started as she's walking through the woods. She noticed that the light was coming through the trees on the right side and the left side, kind of alternating. And as she was walking and as she kind of was like noticing the light coming through and letting her eyes kind of follow where the light was, she noticed that she had less distress in her body. The memory that she was just thinking about, she was like, oh, like I'm I'm actually not, I don't feel as bad. Like I'm still able to recall what the memory was. I'm still sad that my, you know, cousin or whatever was upset but I'm not feeling upset about it anymore. And like, that's really weird. And so she took that mechanism, went home, did a crap ton of research <laughs> of like, how is this possible? How did my eyes move? Like, and how, how is this, how am I fine now? How did that happen? And so, yeah, she did a ton of research and then founded like the Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing International Association. <laughs> like, she's just crazy. Is there ever a time where like they've become like really distressed just remembering everything how do you ground them back into reality at that point yeah and this is why it's so important to do in-person sessions in my opinion just because like if someone is online like there's only so much that I can do to ground them you know there's only so much like I can only scream at them so many times or I can you know instruct them to do things right but like I don't have any actual control. I don't have any presence in the room. I don't have any understanding of what's happening on the other side of their screen. And so when they're in the office, I feel like if they're, yeah, maybe dissociative, meaning that they're maybe more in the memory than they are present in the room. Um, that's kind of when they get caught up in those feelings of, yeah, emotion, distress, things like that. Um oftentimes like you kind of just have to really ground them in the present moment. So again, reminding them that the thing you're experiencing, the thing that you're thinking about, that already happened. You already survived that. Like you did an awesome job, whatever you did work because you're here sitting in the office with me right now. Um, 
And typically we in- introduce a lot of like tactile stuff. So like we'll toss something back and forth or um, I'll have them smell. My, I have like a, an assortment of little like um, essential oils that I have them smell and I have them pick their favorite one before we start. And then they're like, oh my God, it's my scent. <laughs> and so we have them like smell that, you know, to help ground them. Um, basically we do anything that we can to bring them back in their body to make them recognize, right? Like you are not in the memory. The memory is not what's your reality right now. Yes, that happened to you. Yes, that's re- extremely distressing and also you've already done the hard part you've already survived and so that is kind of how I ground a lot of my clients and that tends to work um then we can kind of assess you know if it if it happened like five minutes into the session right then we can maybe like kind of tiptoe back into the memory or maybe process something or switch gears into something that's more positive or maybe less distressing um but I I like to continue going on the distressing memory because I think it's really important to prove to like ourselves and our clients you can you can do hard things. You can get through this. Like you can conquer the really distressing things. You can widen that window of tolerance. You can make it. Um, and because once they, once they realize that, once they are like, oh my gosh, I trust myself enough to know that I'm going to get through this processing becomes a walk in the park. Like those distressing things no longer are scary. Cause it's like, okay, I can recognize that this is totally temporary. This is so good. I'm super excited. This when you find something that you're really passionate about, like it doesn't feel like work. It's mm-hmm. like, oh my gosh, I get to do this. This is so exciting. And it's so funny because like my husband is not a therapist, not in this realm at all. I don't know how we ended up together just in terms of like <laughs> like-mindedness. Like he is so logical and like whatever. And so he does like software crap. I don't even, I can't even just explain what his job is to anybody. I'm like, he just does software stuff. That's all you need to know. Um, And so like for him, it's so interesting because he'll come home or, I mean, he works from home, but I'll come home and he'll be like, oh my Oh my gosh like yeah i just had a day at work you know it was just work, right and i'm like oh my god my day at work was this and this and this and this and this right so like it's i think that we're really lucky because yes our job is extremely emotionally draining at times but it's also extremely emotionally rewarding and so when you find something that you're passionate about it doesn't feel like work you're like i get to yep. do this and i feel like research would be like that i just don't know the logistics at all into getting into it exactly i I also feel that way when it comes to, well, I feel that way when it comes to our work. Like, I feel like this Mm -hmm. is not, like, this isn't work for me. It's something that I love to do because I love talking to people. I love getting to know people. I want to know, like, the ins and outs of them. So to me, like, that's, like, the exciting part of being a therapist. And actually, I remember, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I remember seeing one of your your, uh, Instagram videos or TikTok videos about um just like loving the there like the there like being a therapist and doing mm-hmm. all the things that a therapist would do but then the documentation part is like bleh you know oh like God, I hate absolutely. doing that part mm-hmm. of it all like that's the most like dreadful part of it all but other than that like I love doing the whole talking aspect of everything yeah. and Christina yep. can I tell you that like um I'm also one of those therapists too that are kind of just like you're into trauma like I don't know how the heck you do it because Mm -hmm. I I'm usually like the depression the anxiety life transitions grief um things like that for me is 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 my jam right um and I one thing that you said earlier that 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 stood out to me was the fact that you realized that you were in a abusive relationship right Mm -hmm. um and I think it's crazy how and when you're in the moment in those in, in those types of relationships, you don't really realize like what's going on in the moment because you yeah. truly, really do lose yourself mm-hmm. in those relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, like for me, in, in my last relationship where I was in, in a relationship for, for seven years um, and I didn't realize that manipulation was abuse, like a form of mm-hmm. emotional abuse, but it really was. But to know that I was manipulated and and you know gaslit and all these other things it's crazy because Mm -hmm. you you just really don't think about it in those moments so I did want to like let you know like I can definitely relate to that and 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 again it's just crazy that you really don't see those things in the moment and Mm -hmm. like when once I got into therapy and she told me like no this is definitely a form this is not healthy by the way (laughs) Like, this yeah. is a form of, like, emotional abuse. I'm like, huh. Like, I didn't know that. And, like, oh, my. And yeah. it's kind of just like, oh, my God. I was in an emotionally abusive relationship. Like, that yeah. is crazy to me. 
Yeah. You know? When again, it's kind of tying back, right, to like mental health versus physical health, right? Like if you if you saw somebody getting hit or if you experienced physical abuse during a relationship, you'd be like, oh, yeah, no, I'm in an abusive relationship for sure. Look at this black mm-hmm. eye. Like this is evidence, right? But like, yeah, when I work with survivors or like in my relationship, like I had absolutely no idea that like, yeah, gaslighting and um, yeah, manipulation and mm-hmm. just like all that stuff. I had no idea that that was a form of abuse as well. And so that um, emotional abuse, like that I I hear and have experienced that takes harder to process and to heal from because there was no quote unquote tangible evidence Mm -hmm. to suggest, right. That I was actually being abused. And so, yeah, I mean that I I hear a lot of times my clients be like, I would, I would rather they've just hit me. Like I would have rather them just have physically shown me like that they were hurting me because that would have been easier to recognize, right? That emotional abuse is not easy to recognize at all when it's happening because you're right, you're in it. You are in it and you can't really see anything different. Interesting. That's interesting. And and I wonder I wonder what people's thought process are like when they say that too. Like I would rather feel like I would rather them hit me mm-hmm. versus going through like them saying you know, whatever negative stuff that they usually should, they usually say, mm-hmm. um, because I, I don't know what, e- even if I look back at my relationship too, like I wouldn't know what would be worse for me, mm-hmm. either the emotional part of it or like being physically abused. Physical abuse. I think the reason why they said that is because it's like, at least then I would have that evidence to be like, mm-hmm. oh, this is unhealthy. Like, oh, okay. Well, they're hitting me. Like I'm going to leave. Right. But with the emotional abuse, because it's just so sneaky and it just it plays so perfectly on maybe yeah. their trauma responses or like what whatever you have going on in your life, like yeah. it just perfectly slides in there undetected. And therefore, you're likely to stay in a relationship longer because you can't really detect that. But if they're like, yeah, hitting you or doing something physical to you, you're like, okay, well, this black eye, <laughs> this was not fun. And now I have tangible evidence that this is an abusive relationship and I need to leave it. And it wasn't until, you know, I took that time to be single, to have the healing, to do the therapy, to do the work, to be healthy, that then I wasn't looking for a relationship really. And then like my husband, who we've been together for six years now, he then came along and was like, oh, hey, what's up? And (laughs) when you, you know, when you like have your own peace, when you develop a sense of peace and someone comes in and disrupts that, you're so much quicker to be like, get the hell away from me. You're not adding anything to my life, right? Like go away. But then if somebody comes in, they're like adding peace to your peace. It's like, oh my God, this is fantastic. Wonderful. And so after you've done the healing work, it's really easy. It's, or I guess it's easier to see like what's healthy and what's not. Was it scary at all though? Like when he said it, when he came into your life, I would oh have been God. like, oh my God. <laughs> oh, I was like, you're manipulating me. Get the hell out of here with your kindness. Like this is crap. You know, it was totally like I had to confide in all of my friends and be like, okay, so he did this. He bought me flowers. Like what is his game? What is, <laughs> what is he doing right now? What is happening? And they're like, is it possible that he just bought you flowers because he's the game? You're like, nope, it's not. So <laughs> you must be doing something else. <laughs> like whatever. So that was a huge learning curve. And I find that to be pretty, pretty on point, actually, with a lot of people who get out of abusive relationships and then find somebody who's healthy. Like, they're like, this is the hardest thing I've ever had to do because I'm trying to like mind read and guess and play games and they're not. And I don't know what's what's real and what's not. So yeah, it was, it was a hard first year, but obviously worth it. Um, But yeah, it was difficult. And He's the most patient human being on the face of the planet and had to put up with my my nonsense for a year. So I'm like, you're it. You've won. <laughs> You've won the prize. You've won. Me. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Now, yeah. I, I, I really do want to shift gears on just the fact that, like, you do a lot. You mm-hmm. do. And so what is christina doing for her right what is what is the regime what's happening Uh right now Uh yeah so for me i mean a huge piece of my self-care is animals um so like i had a bunny that i had for eight years eight and a half years and when she passed away i noticed my mental health just just going downhill i know i was like oh my god my baby (laughs) and so we my husband and i we rescued um a a dog who is nothing like a bunny He's huge. He's absolutely huge. Um, And he, of course, is the world's most anxious dog on the face of the planet. Like, we had no idea. We were like, oh, he's just such a sweetheart. He's a 60 pound whatever. We're like, oh, my God. So that has been a really, really interesting process to see, like, 
basically not only see the relationship developing between him and my husband who has never had a dog before um and then me and my dog and Ziggy uh like developing that relationship with like a super anxious animal is I think just rewarding in a different way because it's like I've seen how anxious you can be and now that we've been together for a couple years like now you're not as anxious and like it's just the quality time that we have together is awesome and so spending time with Ziggy is fantastic um but also we we need to get out more so uh, like uh we all as a family like we go on walks um we try really hard to vacation often um we really don't watch that much tv like i i think that i've definitely fallen habit to binge watching you know the hottest thing on you know netflix or whatever hulu and does nothing for me like my body hurts sitting on my couch for that long and <laughs> i've like what have I gained from this? Like, I'm just upset now. <laughs> like, I'm just angry at all these people. So I try really hard to not consume a lot of, you know, TV. Um, I try really hard not to spend time on my phone. But obviously, now that I have an Instagram account, like, I'm on my phone all the time. Um, but I, I, I justify it because it's like, I'm not mindlessly scrolling. I'm not just watching video after video after video. I'm creating content. I'm engaging with other therapists. I'm going on other therapist pages and correcting what they have to say about EMDR. <laughs> I'm like doing all these like social justice type things like um so like it's it's been it's been really good to just be more in my body and doing physical activities that make me happy um and I also started crocheting and I made I've made the ugliest things so far it's just absolutely <laughs> hilarious and so fun <laughs> yeah like do you ever have those days like especially owning your own private practice and just seeing all these clients that deal with a lot of trauma. Like, do you ever just experience burnout at all? Yeah, I think because I've worked in community mental health and then I worked at a group practice where we were not treated fairly, both of those experiences in my life have taught me exactly what contributes to burnout. It is like seeing too many clients, not having enough support, um, feeling as though you are being used. So feeling as though like it wouldn't matter if you left, like you could be easily replaced, like you're not special in the workplace. Um, and also then, yeah, just not having time like to yourself. So I was working, you know, I was seeing eight clients a day for five days a week. I mean, just horrible, horrible stuff. And then on the weekends, I would notice that Saturday would be my day to just recover. I wouldn't want to talk to anybody. I wouldn't want to do anything. I would just be like, leave me the hell alone. I need to be in a cocoon of nothing. <laughs> And then Sunday would be the day that then I would have to do chores because Monday is around the corner. Two days is not enough. It's not enough. So what I definitely took into consideration when I was building my private practice is I, and again, this is my personal preference. A lot of people don't agree with it. I front load my weeks, meaning I see nine people on Monday, nine people on Tuesday, five people on Wednesday, and then I'm off the rest of the week because I need Thursday to just decompress, see nobody, just focus on doing notes or, you know, whatever, whatever thing that I need to catch up on. And then Friday is my actual weekend. So then I have Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday is the day where you mentally prepare and have the Monday, you know, the Sunday scaries. So like Sunday doesn't count as a relaxing day. It <laughs> doesn't count. So yeah. like you just, you need to have two full days off where you are not thinking about work, where you are not doing work-related things and you are just existing and doing things that you want to do. And so that was something that I had to learn through just my work and professional process. Um, and I took that into consideration when doing my private practice. Since I started this new job back in December, um, my schedule has been just like, I've been everything, like everything that I used to do, I just haven't been doing because I'm trying to figure out like a schedule and just like how, you know. So I just recently started doing boxing again. And it's been such a huge reminder to me of just like how, much of a stress reliever it is for me and to just like get all of those emotions out that that I've been like internalizing throughout the whole entire yeah. day. I love boxing. I personally haven't done boxing like consistently or anything, but I know like I, I tell my clients like if if your automatic go-to trauma response is fight, get yourself some damn gloves and go punch something. Like go get that energy out. I, I know one of my best friends, um, she loves boxing and I've attempted to go to a class or two with her and it's great. I love it. Um, me, I haven't taken a class in a long time, 
Um, but I do do soul cycle and in the middle of the class when it's time to do arms, a majority of the instructors are just like, okay, with the weights, they do right, left, right, left. And it, it mimics that boxing movement. And so it just feels so good. And then I've it also does. seen people like there's been, uh, this new, machine like it tells you where to punch and it oh. goes with music it it looks so cool i want to get it it's but... like musical boxing <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. and i think boxing is the best stress reliever um i've done so many things that involve stress relieving like i've done hatchet throwing i've done um i've done boxing i've done um i think it was um this breaking room oh the rage room oh yeah 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 those are amazing like anything that just gets you out of your mind and just if you need to break something you break something like i love it it's great and i love the fact yeah. that ashley has been doing that for herself because i know with the new her new schedule and everything it's been really hard for her to find time and mm -hmm. i know yesterday she posted like it's a boxing day i knew she went and i was like this is great i love the fact that she's back into it yes. because i it it changes your mood it mm -hmm. changes the way that you are for that day if it it helps not to like be angry at other people in that moment like I know with our jobs, like, obviously, our clients' um, feelings and stuff, they can stick on to us. And so sometimes we can carry those feelings. And just the fact that it's there to help us distract ourselves and mm -hmm. get those those thoughts out of our mind and remember that we are not them. We are not carrying mm -hmm. those issues. We are our own individual people once we leave our jobs mm -hmm. i think it's fantastic it's phenomenal and so i'm happy yeah. for the like update we, we've Ashley. done everything we can do yeah yeah i love that that's amazing well and also i mean going back to emdr like boxing because you're not punching two at the same time like boxing is a form of bilateral as well you know because you're doing right left right left alternating um and so, yeah, I boxing is phenomenal. That's so awesome that you're doing that. I am slowly like reminding myself of like things that I love to do, and and like I've been letting my job get in the way of of all of it. So mm -hmm. to help me de stress myself, like it's 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 been awesome. It really has yeah. been. Well, and again, <laughs> like not not only I know the things that I like to do, but then going out and actually doing those things, yep. like you're proving to yourself, I'm worthy of my own time. Like I'm worthy of doing those things for. Yep. And that's why I think a lot of people get caught up in that of like, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be drinking water. I'm supposed to be eating healthy. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be going to the gym. I'm supposed to be doing all these things, you know, and, but then they don't, it's, it has nothing to do with their want, has nothing to do with that. Like it is truly, do we have the energy? Do we have the motivation? And are we, do we feel like we're worthy enough of doing that, of doing kind things for ourselves? And a lot of people would say no, like unfortunately and, that, and subconsciously. What do you, what would you tell somebody that's trying to get into the field? I would say that, you know, if you have a passion or an interest for this work, like get into the field. I think that a lot of people sometimes wait until, you know, they've done their own therapy or wait until, you know, they feel like the timing is perfect or whatever. And, or they, you know, do their own self-study because they're like, oh, I want to know everything before I go into this field. And you can study until you die and still not know everything you're going to need to know going into this field. Um, like you, you have to be open to learning new concepts. You have to be open to learning that you're not always right. And that's fine. Um, like you have to just kind of let go of that power a little bit, even though you're in a power dynamic with a client, like they're the expert of their own story. And so I think some people maybe go into therapy or the therapeutic field thinking like, oh, I'm going to be a Freud figure. I'm going to, you know, have my clients lay down on the couch and they're going to tell me their blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, that's not what therapy is anymore. Like therapy is very much like two people who are humans in a room talking about stuff. One of them has, you know, credentials to actually help. The other one is just existing. And so there's a lot of nuances that go into being a therapist and you just have to be flexible and you just have to be open to that. But if you have an interest and a drive to help people like go into the field, it's fantastic. Absolutely. And now knowing 
that you do what you do with having your own private practice and such. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best, where's your mental health at today? I would say it's probably an eight. Like it's pretty good. You know, I think that I don't know if I've ever actually been at a 10, maybe at Disneyland, but like <laughs> but Disneyland. Happiest that, place in the world. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't me. That was being at Disneyland, you know? So, I mean, I think, yeah, my mental health is pretty dang good. Like I have my own therapist. I don't know if I, I know that some therapists don't have therapists and that's okay. And also, I'm definitely going to start making videos that poke fun at therapists who don't have therapists just because it's like we want to practice what we preach, you know, like we want to do that and have that extra support, you know. So um, I think that it's super important that therapists have their own therapist. And um, yeah, just doing all of that really, really, really hard work. Um it, it pays off. Like it's not instantaneous. I can tell you again, like even, even though my mental health was not good when I was going through the graduate school program, like I have just done nothing but learning and healing since then. And now it's been, okay, hold on math, uh, seven years. And like, I'm doing better. I'm doing much better. I would probably say that back then I was probably a four out of 10 and now mm -hmm. I'm an eight out of 10, you know? So like I'm doing much, much better. Um, and so again, like your mental health doesn't have to be perfect to go into the field, but you do have to have enough self-awareness to notice like what's going on for you and also getting like, your own help. So we covered a lot of things. I really appreciate you educating me on like what EMDR looks yeah. like and just the whole process of it, because I literally had no idea. We we learned about this stuff like very briefly in school, but like I never really cared to pay attention to it just because I was like, all right, trauma's not my thing. So like totally just absolutely out the window. I an interest of it just because like I've heard clients be like, oh, like EMDR has worked for me. And I'm like, okay, but like, what is that? What does yeah. that look like? So to know that you were able to just educate me on that and, and even our viewers and just like mm -hmm. what that looks like yeah. I I love it and I really appreciate you taking the time out to to talk to us today because this has been such an awesome conversation yeah, absolutely yeah. yeah and if anybody wants to know including you guys if you if anybody wants to know more information about EMDR um the most reputable place because there's a lot of stuff going around the most reputable place to get that is emdria.org like that is again Francine Shapiro fan founded the International Association that is going to be the most reputable, up-to-date research and information that you can possibly find. You can also look for an EMDR therapist on that page. So you can go to that page and there's like a little tab at the top that says, you know, find a therapist. That's where you could find an EMDR therapist for somebody. So it's a fantastic resource. I highly recommend it. I send all my clients to it. And if you're interested in getting training too, they have training opportunities as well. That's great. Awesome. And thank you so much for, for coming on and um, re- introducing me to emdr because like mm -hmm. ashley i've heard about it i've also have you know touched on the topic because trauma um, <laughs> because but trauma. um <laughs> yes <laughs> but i've never really got that much information out of it so i also did learn a lot today so thank you so much for that yeah absolutely my pleasure i mean if, if the one thing that i'm known for ever is go to her with all of your emdr questions like i've done my job right so that's mm -hmm. fabulous and i will never get tired of talking about it i personally hate doing research um mm -hmm. so which is also probably why i haven't been able to to get my phd or anything that like that because <laughs> research is just not my thing um and so so to seriously hear it from you it, it's i love it mm -hmm. um now with that being said thank you guys so much for watching please like subscribe comment share this with your friends and family listen to us on apple podcasts and spotify follow us on therapists underscore unmasked on tiktok and instagram and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Yes, bye. <laughs>